Thank you so much for joining today in A Voice from Heaven. Great that you're here, that you decided to join, and um, it's quite the party. So it's great to uh, say continue um, and open even more to what is given. And, and everything is going to say support that, to, to come into a complete opening uh, of your consciousness for what is given. Uh, by your allowance, by your say, by you saying yes to that. So it's like, oh yeah, yes, I want more of that. Yes, open, yes. So today we continue with chapter 18. Um, the basis of the dream is this uh, specific section that we're looking at. And we're, we're having Master Teacher come over with one part. And there is a daily lesson that I love to take a look at. Uh, because the daily lesson is has everything to do with forgiveness, with uh, true forgiveness in this sense. Um, and there's a great overlap with chapter 18, the basis of the dream, since we're talking about special relationships, about you in your human relationships, uh, you with an idea of somebody did something to you, and all these kinds of ideas, all that, uh, say, is going to be put in the pr appropriate place, in fact, to for it to be dissolved, for you to become free of it, not to linger in it, not to stay with it, not to keep digesting it, not to keep forgiving everything. No, this brings you right to the place where you actually yeah, see it for what it is and find yourself in the place that you truly are. Now that is different. Um, so I'm starting with um, the daily lesson. I read some things of it, like I read some paragraphs of it. So first of all, it is like the thing that you don't want to hear, you will not hear. So in other words, if you're open to receive what is given, then you can actually hear what it says. If If you feel resistance to hearing what is being shared, you're probably not going to hear what is being said. And at the same time, you did hear it. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel the resistance. So either way, it works. <clears throat> Which is really fun. So if you want to enjoy it, be open. If you want to resist it, good luck with that. That's fine. You heard it anyway. So in other words, resistance is useless in this. But when it comes to forgiveness, it is particularly um, difficult to hear if you want to hold on to an idea about someone or something or your past. It's particularly difficult to hear because you want to stay with what you got and what your idea is. You want to stay with your right. So that's where the difficulty comes in. Now here we start. Lesson 134. Let me perceive forgiveness as it is. Let us review the meaning of forgive, quote unquote, for it is apt to be distorted and to be perceived as something that, it, that entails an unfair sacrifice of righteous wrath, a gift unjustified and undeserved for a complete denial of the truth. In such a view, forgiveness must be seen as mere a mere eccentric folly and this course appear to rest salvation on a whim this twisted view of what forgiveness means is easily corrected though when you can accept the fact that pardon is not asked for what is true like that's good to know forgiveness has nothing to do with truth like you never have to forgive what is true it truth is already true so there's something else going on now what is that it must be limited to what is false oh yes it is irrelevant to everything except illusions right so it only deals with illusions truth is god's creation 
and to pardon that is meaningless. All truth belongs to him, reflects his laws and radiates his love. Does this need pardon? No. How can you forgive the sinless and eternally benign? No need to. The major difficulty that you find in genuine forgiveness on your part is that you still believe you must forgive the truth and not illusions. You conceive of pardon as a vain attempt to look past what is there, to overlook the truth in an unfounded effort to deceive yourself by making an illusion true. This twisted viewpoint but reflects the, ho the hold that the idea of sin retains as yet upon your mind, as you regard yourself. Because you think your sins are real, you look on pardon as deception. For it is impossible to think of sin as true and not believe forgiveness is a lie. Well, let's repeat that once more. Because you think your sins are real, you look on pardon as deception. Why would you forgive? You know you're right, so why would you forgive? For it is impossible to think of sin as true and not believe forgiveness is a lie. Thus is forgiveness really but a sin, like all the rest. So this is really the distorted idea. It says the truth is false and smiles on, on the corrupt, as if they were as blameless as the grass as white as snow. It is delusional in what it thinks it can accomplish. It would see as right the plainly wrong, the loathsome as the good. Pardon is no escape in such a view. It merely is a further sign that sin is unforgivable, at best to be concealed, denied or called by another name, for pardon is a treachery to truth. Guilt cannot be forgiven. If you sin, your guilt is everlasting. Those who are forgiven from the view their sins are real are pitifully mocked and twice condemned first by themselves for what they think they did and once again by those who pardon them <laughs> so that makes it really messy and this is why you walk around with in your human idea about yourself guilt cannot be if you're guilty you're guilty like that cannot change so you you are doubly mocked say twice condemned first by yourself of first by the ones that think that you're guilty and then by those who forgive you now it's really becoming really really messy it is a, it is sense and reality that makes forgiveness natural and wholly sane a be deep belief to those who suffer it a quiet blessing where it is received it does not countenance illusions, but collects them lightly with a little laugh and gently lays them at the feet of truth. And there, they disappear entirely. It is sin's unreality that makes forgiveness natural and wholly sane, a deep relief to those who offer it, a quiet blessing where it is received. Forgiveness is the only thing that stands for truth in the illusions of the world. It sees their nothingness and looks straight through the thousand forms in which they may appear. It looks on lies, but it is not deceived. It looks not heed the self-accusing shrieks of sinners mad by guilt. It looks on them with quiet eyes and merely says to them, Brother, what you think is not the truth. The strength of pardon is its honesty, which is so uncorrupted that it sees illusions as illusions, not as truth. It is because of this that it becomes the undeceiver in the face of lies, the great restorer of the simple truth. By its ability to overlook what is not there, it opens up the way to truth, which has been blocked by the dreams of guilt. Now you are 
Are you free to follow in the way your true forgiveness opens up to you? For if one brother has received this gift of you, the doors open to yourself. Okay, so this is really great. And this is really what this is. And so to bring it back to yourself, which is a good idea, of course, is like you actually know this. So you you have you have experiences like this, like whatever. Maybe this was with a loved one or this was with a friend or this was with a moment in which something seemed to have occurred. But uh, in this moment of uh, shared forgiveness you could say something happened so you you actually came into a uh, release of ideas of both parties you you could say by recognizing your unity and, and equality instead of the differences you have experiences like that for sure it's like the moment that you actually feel the whole story collapses and feel that it wasn't about your right or the other one's right and the other one's yeah uh, something happens so you you suddenly recognize yourself as being connected to the one that seemed to be opposing you for just a moment none of that was true now in this moment which maybe you recognize as a very special event um, in your say in your memory of yourself um, it seemed like a very special event because actually you felt love you f you felt that everything was collapsing that you came into a recognition that you're one with your brother and you love your brother as yourself despite of what was happening despite of what occurred now this is what we're talking about. In fact, you can stay there all the time. You don't have to move away from that place. If you allow your um, situation, if you allow your stand that you take to collapse, if you allow yourself to, to be free of your own story, something can really shift. If you give up that you want it a certain way, but just let the situation be as it is, by having it become brand new to to you then there it is so like it's as simple as that so and this is in fact the way we walk uh, the only thing that uh, that really comes up then is your gratitude um, happy not to be bound by any definition of the situation Happy not to be bound by in history. Happy not to be bound by in future difficulty. But just, in fact, allowing this moment to be whole and perfect. And sharing that, celebrating that with your brother. No matter what seemed to have occurred. No matter how it has been looking. No matter how guilty you thought you were or your brother were. Like, no, despite of that like nothing happened now this is this is the practice that has been given in the course in miracles so it's not keep on forgiving no it's it is like keep recognizing that this moment is free of all ideas that this moment is innocence itself this is your recognition of your innocence by recognizing it in your brother you recognize it in yourself that's all and then you're free of it free in fact of this world because this world is like the place where you act out you want it a certain way you want to be right you want it thus way this way it's like that's exactly what uh, chapter 18 the basis of the dream will say too so let's head over to that the basis of the dream which is a really incredible um part of the chapter it's an incredible part of the chapter the basis of the dream is like okay yeah we know this is a dream okay we know that but now we go to where is it made of what what does it what does it mean what is that what is that dream <laughs> so i will definitely tell you something about that 
does not a world that seems quite real arise in dreams yeah, when you go to sleep at night you see dreams yes does it seem quite real yeah but think what this world is it is clearly not the world you saw before you slept rather it is a distortion of the world planned solely around what you would have preferred so it's a distortion of the world planned solely around what you would have preferred that one error which brought truth to illusions infinity to time and life to death was all you ever made your whole world rests upon it everything you see reflects it every special relationship you ever made is part of it dreams are chaotic because they are governed by your conflicting wishes and therefore they have no concern with what is true they are the best example you would have of how perception can be utilized to substitute illusions for truth you do not take them seriously on awaking because the fact that in them reality is so outrageously violated becomes apparent see you do not take them seriously on awaking because the fact that in them reality is outrageously violated becomes apparent you actually start to see through the dream you start to see that you have been substituting illusions for the truth and truth for illusions well that was actually the thing that happened you assumed your illusions as a reality and it wasn't now you start to see that dreams are perceptual tantrums dreams are perceptual tantrums wow well, dreams are perceptual tamper tantrums in which you literally scream i wanted this just like a little child like i want it this way no i want this i want this lollipop with this color this taste i want this and thus it seems to be and yet the dream cannot escape its origin anger and fear pervade it and then in an instant the illusion of satisfaction is invaded by the illusion of terror for the dream of your ability to control reality by substituting a world that you prefer is terrifying i love this so dreams are perpetual tamper tantrums in which you literally scream i want it thus and thus it seems to be and yet the dream cannot escape its origin what is it made of anger and fear pervade it and an instant the illusion of satisfaction is invaded by the illusion of terror it's like suddenly the satisfaction part is turned into terror into attack for the dream of your ability to control reality by substituting a world that you prefer is terrifying that's interesting isn't it all your time is spent in dreaming your sleeping your waking dreams have different forms and that is all their content is the same they are your protest against reality and your fixed and insane wish to change it in your waking dreams the special relationship has a special place it is the means by which you try to make your sleeping dreams come true from this you do not awaken the special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality and to prevent yourself from waking why is that 
See, it's of course great to use the special relationship to act out, in fact, your denial of truth. So you can shape it, like the special relationship. You could say that the relationships as we know as a romantic relationship or the or the special relationship in in the work relationship or the special relationship in a family relationship so you you use those very effectively in fact to have it a certain way with certain laws with certain habits with certain things that you can count on to a certain degree until it doesn't uh, until it doesn't work out um, and they give you a sense of satisfaction as it says here too it's like it is a sense of satisfaction for a moment it just looks like wow this is working so well how wonderful up to the moment that terror is invading that dream and turns it all around and suddenly you stand say opposite of one another wanting to start a fight wanting to dissociate wanting to separate wanting to blame and and shame so this is the basis of the dream so what is that um, see you can shape it you can shape your future with it you can choose like not not this I want that you compare you you do whatever you do so that's why it's so uh, say uh, easy to use in your denial of truth because you shape it any way you want it and you choose what whichever you want because this is still the idea of i want it this way you could say the world is is your idea about how you want it to be and does it work out no so is there a lot of damage and pain connected to it yeah you start to see that so that is, uh, say, a real essential part of the awakening, recognizing that the nature of the dream is, say, in temporal satisfaction up to the point where suddenly terror takes the place of love. In fact, what you called love, uh, because love cannot change, but in your dream, love can change. You can feel for someone or you cannot feel for someone and suddenly what you felt for someone is gone you you want to attack this person or you want to separate from this person it's like see and this is like ideal for for shaping a world as your own reality so that's the basis of this dream it's like an do-it-yourself kind of um, place your little workstation your your place where you where you create your dream and you do your best to protect it and and you really think it is something and you keep yourself busy with it and you exhaust yourself with it and you prove to yourself that it's working and and all these things so in in the awakening then you have passed the point where you see like well there's futility related to this dream like it doesn't say anything about uh, my true relationships you could say so sometimes when you are what i just previously described is like sometimes it is like the moments that i actually experienced say true forgiveness where i actually felt the love for my brother seemed to be like a peak experience in my human uh, life and that felt really good that felt really good it felt totally real now what did i do with that because I cannot create conflicts in order to experience forgiveness afterwards. Like that would be crazy to do that. That's not, that will not work that way either. So there's, what do I do with a positive experience in my, um, in my dream that I think like, wow, that was a real, a real moment for myself. In fact, I cannot find a place for it in my dream. It literally is like, I wouldn't know what to do with it so that's why awakening is so different like awakening is then in fact opening up to to stay right there in in a real place by letting the situations be themselves not um, 
turning it into a certain direction, twisting and turning it into this way, I want it this way. No, allowing the situation to be whole continuously, recognizing my shared um, reality, my oneness with my brother, my unity with my brother. See, then that is in fact like awakening from the dream. I actually come into a different experience altogether. And, and you can say like forgiveness isn't necessary at that point because I'm actually recognizing my connection with my brother. I won't blame him for anything. I will not make him guilty. I also will set myself free of the idea of guilt because I recognize the true nature of my being instead of the image that I was before in the dream that I created. So that's that's so huge about this part of the so it's an essential essential paragraph in the or section in the in the whole idea of dream. So here it is. In your waking dreams, the special relationship has a special place. It is the means by which you try to make your sleeping dreams come true. From this, you do not awaken. The special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality and to prevent yourself from waking. We once said that the first change before dreams disappear, is that your dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. So we, it was being said in, I don't know which chapter that was, but we once said that the first change before dreams disappear is that your dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. That is what the Holy Spirit does in your special relationships. Like you invite the Holy Spirit in your relationship he doesn't destroy it nor snatch it away from you. No, what he does, he uses it differently as a help to make his purpose real to you. Like the, the dream you have in your dream of separation is that you could be happy and you don't know how to do that. So <clears throat> in inviting the Holy Spirit into your relationships, it can be shown to you how it can change to a happy dream. And your special relationship will be a means for undoing guilt in and in everyone blessed through your holy relationship. It will be a happy dream and one which you will share with all who come within your sight. Through it, the blessing that the Holy Spirit has laid upon it will be extended. Think not that he has forgotten anyone in the purpose he has given you. So this is great. So your special relationship will be a means for the undoing of guilt in everyone blessed through your holy relationship. So what is my holy relationship? My holy relationship is my recognition that say, I and my father are one, that I'm one with my father, one with my brother, and that in fact the basis of our uh, connection is love, that we literally represent love to one another and not anything else. So really great. So it doesn't need to become anything. It doesn't need to be anything else than what is being present in this moment, you could say. See, a special relationship has always a future, has always a future accomplishment of goals that are set or expectations that need to be met and all this. So the holy relationship can basically only be recognized in this present moment when, when the altar that we share as a recognition is completely empty. So there's no guilt on it, no sin, no 
situations that are in the way no, it is completely open to be in communication in recognition of oneness in recognition of our unity so through it through this holy relationship the blessing that the holy spirit has laid upon it will be extended think not that he has forgotten anyone in the purpose he has given you so the blessing that the holy spirit has laid upon it is literally your experience of inspiration when this is occurring your release of self-identity when you start to join with your brother so it's not like a theoretical idea it's not a concept no this brings it back to your experience you literally feel inspired when this is happening you feel your connectedness with god with your source and with your brother at the same time that's why this is communicating like it is communicating this way it is what communication is heaven is sure this is no dream it's coming means that you have chosen truth and it has come because you have been willing to let your special relationship meet its conditions in your relationship the holy spirit has gently laid the real world the world of happy dreams from which awaking is so easy and so natural and you can feel that so it's like this is this isn't rocket science no this is literally the simplicity of the love that we share and that's you can feel that it is happening like you can feel that and in that you you see like oh that's so easy to be in fact in this happy dream it is so easy it doesn't have to do in that sense with the world but it's still a dream so we practice the holy instant is literally practicing extending the holy instant by allowing that to occur in our relationships inviting that in you could say letting all our ideas go because they stand like an elephant in a room like no our ideas are absolutely say useless in terms of communication and recognition of our unity you don't need that so you see it takes away uh, any idea about future too it's like this is a real time shift uh, shifting idea it's really what a miracle is it's like it shifts time into into an infinity in fact it's like it literally brings you here in the recognition of your love for your brother and for god well how easy it is then to awaken from this dream it is it is the place where that occurs it is the time in which that occurs it's happening right now it's right here so that is so beautiful now um we're going to listen to master teacher extending the holy instant is the title of the series extending the holy instant what are we doing extending the holy instant that is exactly the practice of what this is so first we started with forgiveness recognizing that all the ideas that we hold about a brother are past related i have nothing to do with right here right now it has also nothing to do with truth I, when you are willing to give those ideas uh, up then you start to become open for this present moment in which um, say and holiness is recognized and a blessing is given in terms of grace is just dawning upon it the light of heaven is shining upon it now we're going to extend that that moment by not picking up any ideas that would be in the way by not holding on to ideas about a future or an accomplishment no just letting this moment be whole just letting this moment be real just letting our relationships be real not by how we define it no letting it all letting all our definitions go all right so sharing then uh, 
15 minutes, I think, of Master Teacher in Extending the Holy Instant, Part 1 and Section 2. We're talking about holy instances. <laughs> but so you guys got so much perceptual junk in you that it's hard, you know, you're, you get all, do you understand that any opinion is an attack on God? Do you do the course, guy? I mean, I'm just giving you the sentences. And any opinion you have <laughs> about your own relationship is an attack on reality. God doesn't know about it, but you do, and you attack him, and he doesn't respond. You demand a response, and he won't give it to you, so you curse him for not answering your prayers of death. He doesn't answer your prayers of death because he can't hear you. He doesn't understand being sick. He doesn't under Why would God, what does God know about sickness and pain and death? Nothing you know about it. How about the devil? He knows about it. He's a force that's opposed to God. Does God know about him? Yeah. Then he's not all powerful if he can't do anything about him. If he could do something about him and doesn't, he's not all good. I don't want anything to do with a God that allows the devil. You have him. All you've done is projected your own devilship, your own separate association with yourself outside of you and given it an objective reality, the same as you've given God an objective reality, and you're caught between the devil and God. Whose side do you decide to be on? What qualities do you think that this consciousness would have, this evilness, that would be different from this consciousness? Obviously, this perfect, loving God is allowing this perpetration of this evil thing. That's absurd. That's sense. You have that if you want to. I would never know what sides to choose. Which side do I choose? God is going to have to define to me what he means by evil. If God will tell me, this is what I went through in my awakening for you guys that struggle with this, all I ever asked God was to tell me what I'm supposed to do. But he never answered me. How about thou shalt not kill? Okay. Is that, is that one of the commandments of God? That's a commandment of man. God has nothing to do with thou shalt not kill. He doesn't know about death. I don't know where you hear this. That's Jehovah. That's the God of Abraham. That's not the God of... That's the first covenant, isn't it? That's the exchange. That's the idea of thou shalt not do that or this will happen to you. That's the idea of an eye for an eye, isn't it? That's the first covenant. No, this is a God of love. He knows not of death. He would can never command you not to kill. He doesn't know what that is. How could he? Okay, now the basis of this teaching is that evil is only separation, and you are separate from God, therefore you are evil. But evil cannot be real, therefore you are not real. Now you can be happy. <laughs> Well, be happy that you're not real, and that, then you can, you, there was a, used to be for you addicts, some of you addicts that are here used to do the 24-hour book, and there's a lovely 24-hour book that says, wear the world like a loose garment, okay, you're caught in a box of time and space, and the whole basis of this teaching is to allow you to relinquish your own associations with the thing that you are demanding redress for. All human consciousnesses are only grievances. You hold on to your past associations and attempt to change them in the present, and that's impossible to do because they're based on something that happened a year ago. How are you going to change it? If it's gone away, if you base your reality on what's gone away, what's good that's going to do you? I watch you guys go through counseling sessions in order to justify the veracity of your grievance, and it just really gives me a pain. You got an idea that you're going to form groups to justify the things that happened to you 20 years ago, and you get together and say, well, we were all beaten with lollipops. Or, <laughs> I don't care what you tell me, you're going to justify yourself to hold on to the grievance instead of undergoing the experience of forgiveness. I, some of these groups are support groups for support groups. They're coming up with a support group for a support group for a support group of, of children uh, who had grandchildren who were alcoholics. And just, just nonsense. Anything to what? Keep a mutual identity rather than undergoing the experience of saying, that's okay. Well, I, after all, I, I, these, if these things hadn't happened to me, 
I wouldn't be this way. You're caught. You'll never get out of it. What a terrible situation to find yourself in. These things have all happened to you, and all of a sudden you're standing here, and that's already happened. The transformed mind undergoes this. It discovers that forgiveness is forgetting. My mind that went through a transformation is very capable of remembering exact, exactly the same grievances that my sister holds against the occurrences in my framework of time. You and I share a same time framework. My sister will, I'll tell my sister what a wonderful time it was to be alive in the 30s. I'm, I don't, I don't look that old, but that's because I underwent my awakening. But, and, I, and, I, and I say, gee, remember the family and all the loving things we did, and we would go and get a cold root beer. And my sister is, oh, I'm telling you, what do you mean it's good? Your dad was drunk and he fell down the stairs and we didn't have anything to eat. And, hmm? We lived exactly the same experience. Exactly the same experience. Now, did I practice giving up the resentment that my sister exercises against my father? Uh-uh. I love my father's weakness. How can I say this? I love him for being exactly what he was. Because if he hadn't been what, it was, what he was, I wouldn't be what I am now. What did I do? I took the apparent adversity of the grievance and turned it into a benefit. I turn, this is the whole teaching, this is my whole teaching. I'm really giving it to you here, if you can hear it. Everything that could possibly have occurred to you in all space and time, every karma memory, most particularly the one of this, memory of this world, has brought you to this time, to this place, right now. Okay? All of those memories can be brought together and you can call this forgiveness if you want to, so that you have the capacity to remember the now. To say, if that hadn't happened to me, wow, I wouldn't be able to be happy and joyous today. I wouldn't be able to be me because you listen to me. No matter what you pretend or what you do, you're going to be you. I'm telling you, you can decide the kind of you that you want to be, and that's by giving up the grievance of the associations with the past. The past cannot be corrected. It can be forgiven and forgotten. You'll go to your reunions, and, and the whole basis of your reunion will be based on grievances or associations of your family connections. You'll sit down in a chair, and they can hardly wait to remind you of all the terrible things. that The reality of the human race is based on coming together with declarations of the fights that the sisters had. Come tell me, I, I have families. <laughs> and finally, as you go through your maturation, you'll sit there and say, well, why can't we all be loving and loving? In fact, this is what you always did. Most of you were always the counselor in the family anyway, you see. That's, and, <laughs> well, you see, you're making, you're making a little more progress in that regard. And finally, you'll, you'll be sitting there and they'll absolutely insist that you hold on to the resentment. And if you don't hold on to the resentment, they will inevitably attack you for siding with the other consciousness. <laughs> And if you don't do that, they'll attack you simply for, by, for remaining neutral. <laughs> See, the perceptual mind is a condition of attack and defense. I wouldn't want to be here. If you, if I, listen, listen, guys. These consciousnesses that are undergoing spirit, high spiritual experiences have no problems giving up the earth. You, your value systems that are set on the grievance do not understand a transforming mind. A transforming mind takes a look at a human being and says, Whew, I'm glad I don't, I'm not that way. You hear me? I mean, they're really glad. I'm really glad I'm not a human being. I don't want to carry your death and grievances and the things you want. You demand that I do. You demand that you're going to give me an identity in relationship to what you think I ought to be with you, and you're wrong. Okay, my mind is different than yours. Your mind can be like mine. Your mind can become like these minds have become, but it's not there yet. That's a decision that you have to make through the laying down or the relinquishment of the things that you cherish here. Okay, there's no such thing as sacrifice. You're not going to give anything up. 
You can't lose. The idea of loss is absurd. Why would you lose the things you love? I'm kind of, I've never, nobody ever answered me to that. Till you die. So you can accumulate and use it up and get sick and die. Go ahead. I, 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 I just mean, get sick, get die. All you're doing is just <laughs> who's going to stop you from doing that? All you're using the power of the universe. The power that you're exercising is exactly the same as the power of God because that's what it is. There is only one power of mind. You can take that power of mind and hold it in a perceptual relationship, but you can't make it real. Illusions combat illusions. Not God. You don't believe that. You actually think that somehow you're addressing an issue of reality. You're not. You're not. You Course in Miracles people ought to look at what the Course really teaches. If the effect is not real, the cause cannot be real. You keep trying to give yourself a real cause and then say, well, my effects aren't real. That's not what it is. Okay, this is not a real place. Your conception of your association with yourself has no reality. This is the whole basis of the Course in Miracles. Okay, that this is not real. Now you say, well, why does the Course in Miracles give me a choice in this matter? It has no alternative because it's faced with the impossible situation of your belief in choice. No choice is possible in this. If I can get you now to see with some degree of certainty that the enlightenment experience that you are undergoing is an inevitable, you'll stop making pseudo unreal choices about your determination to die. You have no real choice, as taught by any awakened mind, to die, to be sick and die. You're trying to console that way. It won't work. If you give them that, they're going to take it. They're then going to tell you they're in a condition of free will where God gives them the right to get sick and die. That's crazy. That's crazy. Wholeness does not know of sickness and death. You better make that step or you're just going to be out there counseling to death. Why? You have projected the image of your association onto your patient and literally you're killing him by allowing him to express himself to you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe it's time for a, a miracle prayer. Like we're so far out there now. It's like it's so lovely to feel that. Like, wow. So miracle prayer is so beautiful to read. Let me let me share one with you. Uh, with lesson 255. It's a miracle prayer. This day I choose to spend in perfect peace. It does not seem to me that I can choose to have but peace today. And yet, my God assures me that his Son is like himself. Let me this day have faith in him who says, I am God's Son. And let the peace I choose to be mine today bear witness to the truth of what he says. God's Son can have no cares and must remain forever in the peace of heaven. In his name I give today to finding what my Father wills for me accepting it as mine and giving it to all my father's sons along with me. And so, my father, will I pass this day with you. Your son has not forgotten you. The peace you gave him still is in his mind and it is there I choose to spend today. So there is a biblical reference that was what I was looking for. Like the biblical reference is John 1. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. 
he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And in John 18 it says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Whew. How lovely is that? This day I choose to spend in perfect peace. It does not seem to me that I can choose to have but peace today. And yet my God assures me that his son is like himself. Let me this day have faith in him who says I am God's son. And let the peace I choose be mine today bear witness to the truth of what he says. God's son can have no cares and must remain forever in the peace of heaven. In his name I give today to finding what my father wills for me, accepting it as mine and giving it to all my father's sons along with me. And so, my father, would I pass this day with you. Your son has not forgotten you. The peace you gave him still is in his mind and it is there I choose to spend today. Um, so thank you so much everyone, thank you so much for joining today in this uh, meeting, in this allowing truth to be true, in, in this say, this is an accomplishment in itself, just right now, right here, and this we celebrate together. How lovely is that? This is how you want to spend your day, you just decided to do that, and that's all. So does it need anything from you in terms of making plans or having concerns or projecting things in the future? No. Does it need forgiveness? No. Does it need continuous letting go of any kind of idea? Yes. Does it need your, say, uh, in your willingness to be open? Yes. Is that all? Yeah. So this we do, this we practice, you could say, and, and this we enjoy while in fact staying at peace. And the voice of heaven is speaking to us continuously. So we listen, we listen, we listen, I listen. I listen to the still small voice. I listen to this voice in every situation. This is my only focus, this is my only say expectancy that I have is to to wait and listen and to be open. So thank you so much for joining me in that and um, I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much.